Hello, I'm Derek Stewart, Global Product Manager for Power at Amatech Land, and I'm going to talk about technologies which are available to improve fuel handling safety in coal and biomass, with particular emphasis on volatile fuels such as subbituminous coal and biomass pellets. Of critical importance is the problem of oxidation. When coal is exposed to air, the volatile components combine with oxygen in an exothermic reaction leading to spontaneous heating. Today we will discuss the areas of risk in fuel handling systems and the technologies available to detect spontaneous heating and spontaneous combustion. The aim is always to identify the precursors so that the site operation can make the fuel safe before a fire occurs. There are many handling and storage steps as coal is transported from the mine to the plant, or biomass is transported from the pellet mill to the end user. Typically, it's loaded into a truck or train, then unloaded onto a storage pile, coarsely crushed, moved to a day silo, and finally pulverized before being transported to the boiler where it's burned. At each stage, it's important to ensure that the fuel is in good condition and is safe before it can be moved to the next stage. Since the subject of today's presentation is fire and explosions, let's review some basic theory. The fire triangle identifies the three components that are needed for the fire, fuel, oxygen from the air, and an ignition source. Take away any of these components and we no longer have a fire. So typically in fire extinguishing, we will either remove the heat or we will remove the air and the fire goes out. To have an explosion, we require two additional elements and these are illustrated as a pentagon. The dispersion of the fuel with oxygen allows rapid combustion and confinement allows a pressure to build up and then release suddenly. The first stage when a carbon containing fuel burns is the production of carbon monoxide and heat. If sufficient oxygen is available, complete combustion occurs with the conversion of the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide and a lot more heat. Around 80% of the total heat output of combustion comes from this second stage. In spontaneous combustion, we have inefficient oxidation and the fuel only proceeds to the first stage. Therefore, the telltale signs of spontaneous heating and spontaneous combustion are the emission of carbon monoxide and a rise in the temperature of the fuel. As coal ages, it tends to oxidise and crumble. This increases the surface area and so the rate of oxidation also increases. As oxidation proceeds, the spontaneous heating, further increasing the oxidation rate so a runaway condition can develop, eventually resulting in spontaneous combustion when the coal catches fire. In addition to the obvious safety concerns, spontaneous heating and combustion can result in the loss of the purchased coal, which is then no longer available to burn. Lower rank coals are more susceptible to oxidation than hard coals, and subbituminous coals can lose as much as 1.5% of their mass between the mine and the power plant. Biomass also suffers from spontaneous heating and spontaneous combustion. In addition to oxidation, Biological action from bacteria and fungi can cause heating in stored biomass, giving additional hazards with this fuel type. Large amounts of carbon monoxide are produced by the inefficient oxidation associated with spontaneous combustion. Ambient air contains a very low concentration of CO, usually well below 10 parts per million, so a significantly higher concentration provides a fast and highly accurate indication that unwanted oxidation is occurring. Given enough time, the heat buildup gives an observable temperature rise, and this is also an indication that something bad is happening with the fuel. We have three ways to detect spontaneous combustion. Remember, our aim is to detect the danger signs before fire is present. Carbon monoxide emission gives the earliest indication of a problem, but it can only be used in enclosed spaces because the wind will quickly disperse any gas emissions before a measurable concentration can accumulate outdoors. 
That makes carbon monoxide detection ideal for use in silos, storage domes and pulverizers. Temperature measurement is another option for monitoring and preventing spontaneous combustion. These give a direct indication that spontaneous heating is taking place. Because of the time taken for the heat to build up, a temperature sensor gives a slower indication of a problem compared to a CO monitor, but it can still be used in an open area such as a storage pile or a conveyor belt where ambient air movements disperse the carbon monoxide. Finally, there's the fire detection system. By the time that triggers, you know you have a serious problem. There are a number of technologies that are available to detect spontaneous combustion. Today, I will concentrate on the technologies available from Amatec Land, but just to be clear, we're not the only supplier with these technologies available. Number one on the slide shows the arc thermal imager, which is ideal for measurements on open or semi-enclosed storage, such as coal piles or biomass storage domes. Number two shows a conveyor. The hot spotter line scanning infrared imager is specifically designed to detect small amounts of overheating material such as hot spots on a conveyor. And three and four show mill watch and silo watch carbon monoxide monitors which are used to detect the CO emitted as fuel oxidizes within an enclosed space. Infrared thermometry is a non-contact technique that allows for remote temperature measurement. An infrared imager can give a two-dimensional map of the surface temperature of the stored fuel. It's important to note that infrared temperature measurements can only determine the surface temperature, so they may miss a buried hotspot. However, the heat generated by the oxidizing fuel will eventually warm the surrounding material, and the hot carbon monoxide given off will transfer heat to the surface through convection. A study a few years ago by Fierro and colleagues noted that infrared thermography is very efficient at detecting hot spots in coal piles and the losses calculated using the technique correlate very well with those measured directly using thermocouple probes. Depending on the size and geometry of the storage area, several separate thermal imagers may be needed to cover the whole area. The system illustrated here has four imagers with two remote consoles dis displaying the images processing and storing the data. Here we can see a thermal image of a coal pile with a vehicle in the foreground. This is a potential false alarm as the exhaust of the vehicle appears as a hotspot. We can avoid that problem by applying a time delay so an alarm is only flagged if the hotspot has been present for a sufficiently long period. Here's a display screen from a three imager system. In the left hand panel, we see the live thermal image from each camera, with the colour scheme chosen to give emphasis to the temperature range of interest. The upper panel is an image showing an area of high temperature highlighted. The bottom panel shows the patrol record for each of the imagers, with the status of the designated zones. The upper camera has a total of 12 zones of interest. The middle one has four and the lower has eight. For each zone, a green colour indicates no problem detected. Pink shows that one pass found a problem, and red is an alarm condition triggered by three consecutive passes which found a temperature above threshold. Here we see an Amatec Land Hotspot IR infrared line scanner mounted above a conveyor. This is a variant on a thermal imager and is specifically designed to map the temperature of a moving object such as a conveyor belt or a strip on a steel plate. Line scanning has some advantages over conventional thermal imaging. It uses a single infrared sensor, so the consistency of temperature measurement is better than an imaging sensor, which may have over 100,000 separate pixels, each with slightly different characteristics. It's important to remember that a line scanner, like any other thermal imager, cannot see through the fuel and is limited to measuring the surface temperature. Line scanners can also be used to detect hot spots in rail cars delivering fuel to a plant by measuring the temperature of the car itself or by looking at the stream of coal as it's being unloaded from the bottom of the car. 
The high resolution of a line scanner gives it significant advantages over the alternative methods such as a spot pyrometer or a spark detector. These work by measuring the radiation given off over a much larger area. The example here shows a 15 mm hotspot with a temperature 100 Celsius above that of the rest of the material. The hot material here fills only 0.02% of the field of view of the sensor and will register as 0.2%. The high resolution of a line scanner gives it significant advantages over the alternative methods such as a spot pyrometer or a spark detector. These work by measuring the radiation given off by a much larger area than the single spot of the line scanner. The example here shows a 15 mm hotspot with a temperature 100 degrees Celsius above that of the rest of the material. The hotspot fills only 0.02% of the field of view and will register a temperature increase of 0.2 degrees Celsius over the average field of view in a pyrometer. A spark detector is somewhat more sensitive, but will still not register such a small object. The line scanner shown here resolves 100 points across the width of the conveyor, so it can easily detect the same 15 mm diameter hot object and register an alarm. As I've said before, it's important to remember that this is an infrared, not an X-ray measurement, so we are measuring surface temperature. Because of the large amount of data generated by a line scanner, we need to make a decision on how to present that to the user. We don't want to overwhelm the plant operator with irrelevant information that he cannot use. The choice of a full graphical display with image processing facilities similar to those of a thermal imager is one choice, but we can also use a simple peak picking processor. It all depends on what the user needs to get out of the system. Using all of the data allows the operator to see what's going on and especially allows him or her to establish zones of interest within the image. In the example here, we're measuring both the temperature of the material on the belt and the temperature of the edge of the belt. That's important because it allows us to see whether the edge of the belt itself is overheating. And that can occur when a bearing is not running correctly and is causing a lot of friction. The Tilbury power plant fire shown in an earlier slide is thought to have been caused by just such an overheating bearing. Here we have a simpler processing scheme, which indicates and outputs the peak temperature from each scan as a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, along with an alarm relay, which fires if the peak is above a specified alarm temperature. The new Amatec Land LMG Mark II signal processor allows up to four separate line scanners to be con connected to a single processor. Another important decision is where to mount the line scanner. This slide shows a number of possible installation locations. The most obvious is directly above the conveyor, looking down so that you can see the full width of the conveyor in, the, in each scan. However, mounting at a transfer point allows the scanner to see further into the material as it fans out as it comes down. And the increased exposure to air can cause the temperature of the hotspots to increase as well. If you're interested in the temperature of the conveyor rather than the temperature of the fuel, it can be advantageous to mount the, the scanner under the conveyor close to a transfer point so we can see the full width of the belt. Summing up the hotspot detector, is a rapidly responding sensor specifically designed to identify hot, smouldering material on a moving conveyor with very high spatial resolution. A simple signal processor can reduce a lot of data to a single number, or it can be connected to a full-featured image processor for more in-depth analysis. Now let's look at storage silos. Because they're enclosed spaces, Silos and storage domes are best monitored using a carbon monoxide sensor. The sample point should be located near the top of the silo so it can measure the gas in the headspace above the fuel. In most cases, a single sample point is sufficient because natural convection ensures the gases in the headspace are well mixed. However, very large or very asymmetric storage volumes may require additional sample points to ensure adequate coverage. The LAND Silo Watch Monitor is specifically designed to measure CO in the silo headspace. 
It's a self-contained unit combining serial sensors with sample conditioning, signal processing, and calibration verification in a two-foot square cabinet. It's engineered to be robust and to function reliably in the plant environment. Self-checking is important to verify correct operation of the sensor. A negative indication can give a false sense of security if it's false. For example, a plugged sensor will no longer be exposed to the silo atmosphere. Electrochemical sensors are compact and sensitive, but their failure mode is to give zero output. That means a faulty sensor will indicate a low CO concentration in the silo, potentially misleading the user into thinking that they have a safe condition. In situ sensors are easy to install, but a blockage is difficult to detect and calibration checks are usually performed manually by a technician who has to remove the sensor from the silo. Any carbon monoxide formed by spontaneous combustion can be detected in the headspace of the silo or dome. So the sample point must be above the highest fill level of the silo. And it's important that the sample probe does not interfere with the loading chute. In most cases, convection ensures the gases in the headspace are well mixed, but unusually shaped storage vessels may require careful positioning of the sample probe and elongated vessels usually require multiple sample points. Choosing the appropriate alarm level for the CO sensor is also important. A low alarm threshold gives the earliest warning of a problem, but it can result in an excessive number of nuisance alarms. Conversely, an excessively high threshold could allow spontaneous heating to progress to the point of being hazardous without giving an alarm. The exact value is specific to the fuel type and storage location, so it really has to be a site-specific determination. But a good starting point in many places is to choose an alarm threshold between 100 and 200 parts per million of CO. An alternative to a level alarm is a rate of change alarm. This type of alarm will ignore the background level of CO, but respond to the rapid increase that's associated with the early stages of spontaneous combustion. An advantage of a sampling analyzer over an in situ design is it's relatively easy to measure additional species. For example, a silo with a nitrogen blanket can be used to maintain an inert atmosphere. In this case, an oxygen measurement ensures the correct conditions are being maintained. Methane and carbon dioxide measurements are useful in biomass applications as they detect the gases given off by biological activities such as fermentation. Depending on the local environmental conditions, a freeze protected sample line may be needed between the sample point and the analyzer to prevent moisture from the fuel from freezing and causing a blockage. Two sample tubes are generally used, one for the sample and one for the calibration gas. Running the cal gas all the way up to the probe allows us to correct for any losses that may occur and ensures that a leaking sample system will not go undetected. The inside of a silo is always a hazardous area but this usually doesn't cause any difficulty because the only device inside the silo is the stainless steel sample probe. In cases where an analyzer has to be mounted in the hazardous area adjacent to the silo, a Z-Purge allows it to meet class 2 div 2 specifications. This is a pressurization system that ensures that no combustible dust can enter the cabinet enclosure. A dual stream analyzer allows simultaneous measurements from two adjacent silos. In addition to the savings on the cost of the instrument, reducing the number of cabinets saves significantly on the installation cost and on the amount of space needed for the installation. The final area of concern in fuel handling is the mill or pulverizer, where the fuel is crushed to a fine powder before being fed to the burner. A fire or explosion within the mill can cause significant damage and lost production. The greatest explosion risk in a mill is during startup and shutdown, as this is when there is an explosive mixture of fuel and air within the mill. Restarting a hot mill is especially hazardous as it is full of finely divided fuel, and it's likely that this is already oxidising to some extent. The best place to sample the gases within the mill is at the classifier outlet. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, the fuel particles are all moving in the same direction, so an insertion probe can be shielded to prevent abrasion. 
And secondly, the gases have been thoroughly mixed by the movement of the pulverizer, so we can be confident that we are measuring a representative sample of what's inside the mill. Amatec Land's Millwatch and Silo Watch products use the same analyzer, though the sample systems are quite different, reflecting the different sample conditions. The analyzer is self-contained, including sample conditioning, sample pump, signal processing, sensors themselves, and an automatic calibration manifold. As with Silo Watch, a calibration check is an important feature of a mill monitoring CO analyzer. The Amatec Land mill probe is specially designed to withstand the aggressive environment at the mill outlet. It has a large area stainless steel filter to resist blockage, a blowback facility for self-cleaning, and a hardened steel abrasion shield to protect the filter from impact by the high concentration of coal dust passing through the mill outlet. A twin stream millwatch analyzer allows two sample points to be monitored simultaneously using a single analyzer enclosure. For added safety, a pair of twin stream analyzers can be used to sample the outlets of adjacent mills, giving a high degree of redundancy. So far, we've discussed the concepts behind the detection of spontaneous heating and spontaneous combustion for plant detection. Now let's take a look at some concrete examples where operators are using the analyzers to enhance the safety of their operations. The first example is a site where the operators had three mill explosions in the space of five years. They decided to install CO monitors on their mills with a degree of redundancy using twin stream analyzers, as we discussed before, monitoring adjacent mills with two probes into each mill. The reason for the problems with spontaneous combustion was that they were burning subbituminous powder river basin coal, which is well known for its percent propensity to self-combust. After installing the millwatch analyzers, they reported three years safe operation with no explosions. Here's a slide showing how a hazardous condition was identified and made safe without shutting down the boiler. The graph shows the CO concentration and the mill temperature. Initially, the mill was running normally with CO below 10 ppm and a stable temperature. At around 8 pm, the operators saw a sudden increase in CO, but no increase in temperature. They decided to shut down the mill, which caused the CO to come back down and the temperature to drop towards ambient. The boiler output had to be reduced as the mill came offline, but they were still able to generate 300 megawatts of power using the remaining mills. The mill came back into service just before the 11 pm, and you can see a small spike in CO as the fuel was introduced into the mill. The result was that a potential fire or explosion had been avoided, and the only consequence was that the boiler operated at reduced load for around four hours. Drax Power Plant in the UK was at one time Europe's largest coal-fired power plant with six 650 megawatt generating units. Over the past six years, they have converted three of these units to run entirely on biomass pellets, with a fourth conversion underway. Their wood pellets are stored in four huge domes, each measuring 50 metres high and 63 metres diameter. Drax uses both land silo watch seal monitors and land hotspot IR line scanners to monitor the condition of the fuel within the plant. This has helped them to maintain their excellent safety record. Many sites still have older technologies in use and these do have their place. For example, thermocouples can be used to directly measure the temperature of a pulverizer and they can be inserted into stored fuel to measure the temperature within the material. As we have seen, CO measurement gives a much faster indication of combustion within a pulverizer than a temperature measurement. The issues in storage are different and come down to the practicalities of the measurement. Long probes can be inserted into an outdoor storage pile, but they only give a spot measurement and there are hazards associated with personnel operating on the pile. Thermocouple probes in silos tend to be unreliable because the forces exerted by the fuel as the silo loads and unloads damage the probe physically. As an alternative to a, an arc thermal imager, a handheld thermal imager is expensive and is easily available, but it requires some skill to operate effectively because the user needs to recognize the difference between a normal and an abnormal condition. 
The other issue is that any kind of portable measurement is discontinuous and doesn't give a good history, so you can't observe a problem developing. As an alternative to a silo watch CO monitor for silos and storage domes, an in situ monitor can be located inside the headspace of the silo and gives a direct measurement of the gas concentration. But they're difficult to calibrate because they need to be removed from the silo and it's very difficult to verify that the protective filter over the sensor hasn't been blocked, which means there's a risk of operating with no effective monitoring in the silo. A single gas analyzer with multi-point switching can reduce the cost of a monitoring system and there are definitely some advantages to having only one instrument to maintain. However, the switching system itself needs maintenance and the multiplexing means the response time is very slow. That's especially problematic for a mill monitor because, as we saw in the earlier slide, a dangerous condition can develop within just a few minutes. There are also costs associated with the switching system itself because there have to be multiple pumps and valves and these have to be maintained. And the longer sample lines add to the cost of the installation, especially if freeze protection is needed. To finish, let me summarise the ways that Amatec Land can help your plant to operate more safely. First of all, we can share over 20 years of experience in plant protection technology. My colleagues and I are always happy to discuss your requirements and to advise on the most appropriate choices of equipment. We offer arc thermal imagers to monitor hot spots on your fuel storage pile or in a storage dome. Our hotspot IR line scanners ensure hot fuel passing along a conveyor can be detected so you can take appropriate action and divert it or deluge it to make it safe. Our mill watch and silo watch carbon monoxide monitors detect the early stages of spontaneous combustion in enclosed storage areas and in pulverizers. And we're always happy to discuss special engineering for non-standard applications. That's all I have for now. Thank you for attending today's webinar. If you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them. Okay, Derek, thanks so much for that great presentation. Okay, Derek, here's your first question. Are some fuels more hazardous than others? All fuels pose some risk of spontaneous combustion, but the risk increases with the amount of volatile matter within the fuel. Subbituminous coals, like those from Powder River Basin, are notorious for their ability to self-combust, and some types of biomass are also very risky. Uh, for example, pine chips and the bagasse residue from sugar cane processing both oxidise easily. On the other hand, hard coals like anthracite and bituminous coal are much less hazardous because they have less volatile matter within them. Okay, Derek, thanks for that answer. Here's another question. Is there a risk that carbon monoxide coming from the fuel could cause a fire or explosion? Carbon monoxide is a flammable gas, so it could cause an explosion if the concentration were high enough. Fortunately, the explosive limit in air is somewhere in the region of 12%, which is a lot higher than you're likely to find in a typical mill or silo. The bigger danger from CO comes because it's highly toxic. The occupational limit is around 50 ppm, and a concentration of a few thousand parts per million will cause poisoning within a few minutes. Confined space entry is really outside the theme of this presentation, but it's important that personnel working in and around silos understand the hazards associated with fuel oxidation in such a confined space. And thank you once again, Derek. Here's another question that came in. What alarm levels do you recommend? There isn't a universal alarm point for either CO monitoring or for temperature measurement. What we're looking for is a clear signal that something is wrong. So there is going to be a trade-off between getting an early warning and risking false alarms or nuisance alarms. I'll give you an example. Um, there's one site where I was working at and they were monitoring carbon monoxide in a coal mill. The normal operating level there is below 10 ppm, so they set the alarm level at 25 ppm. Unfortunately, they found they could get spikes above that level in normal operation even when there wasn't anything bad happening within the mill. So they increased the alarm level a few times until they settled on a final figure of 125 ppm. They didn't get false alarms and they were still able to get a rapid indication when the CO started to rise rapidly. In most cases I've seen, an alarm level between 100 ppm and 200 ppm works well.
Though I do know of one site where they set an alarm at 400 ppm. They definitely won't get any nuisance alarms at that level, uh, but it will take them a few more minutes to get an alarm when something does start to go wrong. I've also known cases where users will use their data acquisition system and set a rate of change alarm rather than a level alarm. That allows them to ignore a slow background drift while still being very sensitive to the rapid rise in CO concentration that you'll get when spontaneous combustion begins to occur. There's a similar issue in temperature measurement. The challenge there is to allow for variations in ambient temperature and solar heating of the fuel, but still detect uh, a hot spot, a hot inclusion when it's detected, uh, particularly on a conveyor. With that in mind, it might be necessary to set a lower alarm threshold in winter than in summer. You could also do something along the lines of what we do with the spike detection in the CO, where the data acquisition system monitors the average temperature and then sets an alarm if it detects something maybe 50 or 70 Celsius higher than the average background level. Okay, Derek, once again, thank you very much. Let's take a look at the next question. Is automatic calibration really needed on a CO monitor? Surely we don't care if the measurement is 10% out when we're looking for an alarm level of 100 ppm or more. I agree that measurement uncertainty isn't as critical for this type of application as it would be, for example, with something like a continuous emission monitoring system. Uh, the automatic calibration here is actually less to do with measurement accuracy than with verifying that the instrument's functioning correctly. So it's really a case of proof testing rather than calibration. As I indicated during the presentation, the usual failure mode for an electrochemical sensor is to go to zero output. So without our calibration check or our uh, proof test, a dead sensor will look just like a safe condition giving zero CO indication. That would allow a dangerous condition to exist and we wouldn't get a warning of it. So that's really the main reason for the calibration, not the measurement uncertainty. Okay, Derek, thanks for that answer. And this looks like a follow-up to that question. What is the payback time for this type of measurement? It's hard to give a definite figure for the payback time, but a few hours of lost production in a typical coal or biomass fueled plant will pay for an awful lot of monitoring. Even if we ignore the possibility of catastrophic losses, taking a boiler offline to deal with a mill fire will cause a lot of lost production. Here in Pennsylvania, where I live, retail electricity prices are around 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So an hour of lost production on a 500 megawatt plant uh, will give you a value somewhere in the region of $50,000. Okay, thank you once again. Here's another question. How far from the conveyor does the line scanner have to be mounted? The land hotspot IR has a scan angle of 80 degrees, so you can calculate the minimum height using trigonometry. As a quick calculation, uh, that height would be equal to the belt width divided by 1.7. As a bit of background, the 80 degree figure was chosen to give good coverage, but to avoid the distortions that would result with a very wide scan. In the middle of the scan, the measured spot is symmetric, its width is equal to its length. As you scan out to higher angles, the spot becomes elongated in the scan direction. So with a scan angle of 80 degrees, at the edge of the field of view, the spots have an aspect ratio of about 1.3 to 1. If we went out to a wider scan, maybe a 120 degree angle, uh, that distortion would increase and you'd actually get a spot with an aspect ratio of 2 to 1, which isn't really giving you the spatial resolution that you're looking for. Okay, thanks, Derek, for that answer. We've got time for another question. Let's take a look. Is there any way to measure the temperature within the stored material? Unfortunately, non-contact temperature measurements use infrared radiation, not x-rays, so we could only measure the surface temperature of our material. The only way I know of to measure within a storage pile or within the material in a silo is to use a thermocouple or other physical probe. I've heard of silos that incorporate long thermocouples uh, to do that, but the mass of material moving through the silo tends to cause them to break and they aren't really very reliable. Interestingly, uh, I saw a research report a few years ago which compared the effectiveness of infrared imaging to measurements on an outdoor pile made using a probe. Uh, 
they found very good correlation between the surface hot spots and spontaneous heating that they measured within the pile. Okay, Derek, and with that, we're going to wrap things up right there. So, Derek Stewart, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with all of us today. And we'd like to say a special thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. Take care and have yourselves a great day.